Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. We want, you know, it's really funny. Um, I think it's funny, at least. I was sharing with some of the folks at our table during supper um, about, you know, speaking of the Bible in the year, speaking of that, uh, that podcast, um, about maybe a month into it, you know, it was doing relatively well. And uh, some people had, whether I knew them or they just were friends or I didn't know them at all, they got my hold of my number or got a hold of my email and they would message me and say, hey, you know, congratulations, it's really cool, but uh, don't let it go to your head. <laughs> and I appreciate that because, you know, that can happen. Um, but my thought was, I mean, that makes sense. But I've had a podcast since 2007 <laughs> of my own homilies <laughs> that... Um, and then I did, started another podcast in 2015. And now the one that I just like pick up the Bible and say, I'm reading from the Gospel of John, <laughs> chapter 6. <laughs> and read God's Word, that's when it goes. So I'm like, if anything, it's more like humbling than anything else because it's like, wow, when I tried to do it, it was fine. But when God does it, it's amazing. So, <laughs> and, and also that's true, right? When God does it, it's amazing. Um, so I wanted to start, I wanted to start by... Well, actually, uh, so I, a number of you probably, well, n let me assume this thing. I'm a really polished speaker, you can tell. Um, <laughs> I'm good at talking. Uh, I don't know how many of you were part of our virtual front pew that we had during COVID, but one of the things that we announced, or well, I announced during that time, so like five of you, thank you so much, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but one of the things that happened is, is during COVID, during the spring of COVID, my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And... Uh, and she, all, that, all that summer, she went through chemo and she had surgery that next fall. And it, the doctor said it couldn't have gone better. And so that was great. Uh, she just started a, another round of chemo last Tuesday for the next six months because it's back and whatnot. So if you want to keep my mom in your prayers, that'd be amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, and I always say, Mom, can I, can I tell people about this? And she's like, all the prayers. I don't care. Tell everybody. If they're going to pray for me, I want them to know. <laughs> like, okay, Mom. So um, at one point, though, uh, oh, so, okay. I, I was going to keep her name a secret. Her name, just kidding. Her name is Goody. And so here, okay, here, this is not on, in my notes, but <laughs> if you were to picture a Goody, what would you picture a Goody to look like? Would she be like a bubbly, blonde-haired, pink hair maybe? Yeah. So my mom, her actual name is Gudrun Amundsen. So very Norwegian. Her dad, Bjarni Amundsen, Uncle Leif Amundsen, and her older brother, Forrest Amundsen. Um, so good, so Goody, yeah, Goody Schmitz is actually Gudrun Amundsen. So just keep that in mind. My mom, I used to say my mom looked like a beautiful witch. Because, no, 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 listen, listen you know, Maleficent or whatever, the Angelina Jolie, she's beautiful, but she looks like a witch. And so she has very pointed features, she has jet black hair, she has dark eyes, she's just very beautiful, but just like a beautiful witch. That's all. I don't know what to say. It's not Glenda, the other, I mean, but my mom wants, you know, it's funny because my mom, she wants, uh, she wants drew on her eyebrows. Uh, I, told, I told my mom that, mom, you drew on your eyebrows too high. She looks surprised. <laughs> That's not true. She, she doesn't do that. But, um, but, my, but I'll t I will tell you, though, this, that, that my, my mom hates it when my dad refers to her as his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> just, it just gets under her skin like another. Actually, so I, I dated a girl in high school, speaking of girlfriends, who, this is, this is fine, it's a bit. Uh, I dated a girl in high school, um, and uh, she was a tennis player, a tennis player. So we, ha we had to break up because love meant nothing to her. I actually, I actually came up with my own personal version of tennis. Um, it's, it's called quiet tennis. It's like normal tennis, but without the racket. So <laughs> I can keep going if you'd like. So bad news. Uh, the, Newman, the Newman house where I live last night, I wasn't there and it got broken into and someone stole my limbo stick. I mean, how low can you go? Okay, last one. Last one, I promise. <laughs> the bishop is like, what the heck? Why did they invite this man? And I, I thought, I thought this would be kind of fun because I have a bunch more, you guys. You have no idea. But I thought it would be kind of fun because this is the good, it's the good news conference. And this, this recognition of there's something, gosh, life, no matter how difficult life is, there is, there is always room for joy. No matter how difficult life is, there's always room for joy. Not only that, but... Joy is, 
Joy, when we live joy, joy is the witness that is in you. Joy is the witness that just comes out of you. That when we live, the, when, we, when we actually receive the, embrace the faith, um, you can't help but have joy. And so, so the, the, the title essentially of this talk is, is um, we are witnesses of these things. And one of the things we're witnesses of, and one of the things, because you, you, the interesting thing I think is that joy isn't an argument. It's just proof. If you think about it like that, joy isn't an argument. It's just proof. And, and I think that probably the witness to joy, that we're witnesses of these things, that, that where does our joy come from is more necessary in our culture, in our country, maybe than ever. You know, they did a, a survey and they, they found out that 69% of Americans, when asked, reported that they are not very happy. Think about that. 60, almost 70% of Americans, they're asked, they're, no, the, the, the way I live, I, I'm not I'm not very happy. So when we witness, if we witness to joy, there is something powerful about this. There's something that, again, it's, it's not an argument, but it's proof. Even, we even live in a world right now, obviously, right, where uh, a country that, that has built itself off of the fact that you get to pursue happiness. Which is interesting because um, C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, he, he, the last thing he ever wrote that got published before his death was an essay entitled, We Have No Right to Happiness. That we actually don't have a right to happiness. That we have the, we have, we have the right in this country to pursue happiness. But we don't actually have a right to happiness. Which I think is, is really sobering, but really, really important because... <laughs> One of the things we need to realize is that if you want to be happy, you shouldn't be a Christian. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Way to kill a room. <laughs> if you want joy, that's a whole different story. If you want to be happy, though, because if you think about this, if you ask the question, what religion in the world would make you the most happy? The religion that makes you most, the most happy would be the religion of self be me-ism. Because if there's anything that, that, that Christianity is not, is just like, just be happy. It really, it's a religion that promises so much more than just simply happiness. And yet when it comes to happiness, how many, why is it that so many of us aren't happy? I think many reasons it's because we sabotage ourselves, because we keep moving the goalposts, because we think sometimes, maybe this isn't you, but I think a lot of times what we do is we set things up and say, you know, when I'm done, then I'll be happy. When the kids just get out of diapers, then I'll be happy. When I don't have to worry about this, then I'll be happy. When they move out of the house, then I'll be happy. Actually, that's probably true. But <laughs> no, whatever the thing is, though, we, we keep moving it down and say, like, well, when I'm done, when I'm at peace, when, when, things are, when things are fine, then I'll be happy. But we have this insatiable desire. A couple years ago, it was Thanksgiving. <clears throat> and um, I, was, I went into the kitchen. It was, this was after the big meal. And I went into the kitchen, and we made root beer floats. And so I was making all the, I, make, I was telling our table too that I, my nieces and nephews, they have me around their little finger. Like they, if they ask me to do anything, I'll absolutely, I'll do this. And so what happened was they said, Uncle Father Mike, would you make us root beer floats? Of course I will. So I go into the, into the kitchen, I'm making root beer floats and we ran out of glasses. And the only glass we had left was a little shot glass. And so I'm like, this is fun. I'll put a little root beer in there, put a sliver of ice cream on top of it. I brought it to my niece, Sophia, who must've been, I think first or second grade at the time. And uh, so she's like, what? And I'm like, no, this is for you. Okay, so she slams it, and then she puts it down. <laughs> she knew what to, her parents, this whole thing. Um, <laughs> she knew what to do. Um, but her older cousins said, no, Sophia, you don't just put it down. You have to slam it down and say, another. <laughs> she looks at me like, do I? I was like, yeah, go for it. She slams it, another. And so I run back into the kitchen and fill it up. She slams it, bam, another. And her dad says, well, I know what you're doing the rest of the night. <laughs> because we have this insatiable desire, right? We keep moving the goalposts. We keep saying, saying when, when things are at peace, when everything's over with, when I'm done, then I get to be happy. But the reality, of course, is you're not made for that. Like even biologically, you're not made for that. University of Stanford did this study where they took these, uh, you know, amoebas, essentially, these, these single-celled organisms, 
and they put them in complete stasis, a place where they, they had the exact right amount of light and darkness, they had the exact amount of temperature for them, they had all that they needed, all the nutrients they needed, and put them in these completely protected petri dishes. And you know what happened to every one of those living organisms? They became non-living organisms. Every one of them died. Because for life to thrive, we actually need to fight. For life to thrive, we actually need to struggle. A life devoid of struggle is life devoid of life. And so when we move the goalposts and say, well, when this happens, then I'll ha be happy. When this happens, I'll allow myself to be joyful. What we're doing is we're stealing away the joy that actually God wants for you now. I think it's one of the reasons why things like, you know, that, that, that Christianity has always told us to be aware of, things like comfort and pleasure, not to avoid them, but comfort and pleasure and, and being done are to be observed with care because they just can't make you happy. In fact, there was a study out of UC Berkeley that, that said Americans, in order to be happy, they actually have to learn how to be happy because we don't actually do it, we don't do it naturally. Because we keep thinking, mistakenly keep thinking, that it's about feeling, that happiness is a feeling of euphoria. We mistakenly think that um, it's an experience centered on self. We just keep thinking, well, if I get what I want, if, if, if I can do what I want, then I'll be happy. And yet we realize that that's completely not true. Now, that's not to say that you don't get to be happy. But it is to say we need to aim for something bigger, something deeper, something that can be counted on. Because happy, happiness comes from what word? It comes from happenstance. It's an accident. It, it, if my circumstances are like this, then maybe I'll be happy. If they're changed, then I won't be happy anymore. But there's something, as I mentioned before, something deeper than happiness, and it's the thing that you're made for. It's the thing that actually is the gift of Christianity, and that thing is joy. And I want to say this. Um, you know, when God commands us through the sacred scriptures, Regarding joy, he doesn't say, if you can, if things are okay, then rejoice. <laughs> when you're having a really, really good day, then you can rejoice. <laughs> Scripture says what? Rejoice always. That's, a, that's not a suggestion. My mom literally has a bumper sticker that says they're not called the Ten Commandments. Sorry, dang it, I ruined, ruined that joke. <laughs> Which is funnier sometimes. My mom has a bumper sticker that says they're not called the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> oh, that makes sense now. <laughs> so these two clowns are eating a cannibal <laughs> and the one says to the other I think we got this joke backwards because <laughs> the joke's supposed to be two cannibals are eating a clown and one says to the other does this, does this taste funny? okay so <laughs> back to our story joy you're commanded to have joy So what's the marker of a Catholic? You know, so let me back up. If you were to say, what is one thing Catholics are known for? I think a lot of people would say, well, duh. Starts with a G, ends with an ilt. <laughs> I mean, it's Catholic guilt. Go back to Gudrun, because <laughs> she's the star tonight, apparently. Um, but my mom, she's like, my mom always says, why do they call it Catholic guilt? It's, it's just guilt. If you did something wrong, you should feel bad. If you don't feel bad after you've done something wrong, that's called a psychosis. That is called you're a sociopath. That's that something went wrong in you, not something went right in you. But typically, our world around us would associate being Catholic with guilt, and yet at the same time, there's a man, G, man named G.K. Chesterton, and he once said, joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. Can you imagine if that was our secret? If, imagine, again, this is, we bear witness to these things. Joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. That's the original description of Christians. And, and you realize this is because we, obviously, there's two ways of looking at the world. One is that God doesn't exist, and therefore, you can do anything you want because nothing matters. And for a while, you'd probably be happy. One way of looking at the world is God doesn't exist, so do whatever you want because nothing matters. The other way of looking at the world is God exists, therefore I may not do whatever I want because everything matters. And again, the first one sounds more fun. First one sounds like, yeah, that's what the world says. That's, that's, how, you, that's how you have fun. 
And yet, if you think about it and try to live that for more than a week, more than a month, you realize it's a choice between a life that means nothing and a life where everything you do, every word you utter, every heartbreak you've gone through, every sorrow you've ever had to experience, every grief, every joy, every love, it all means something. I say that one more time. There are two ways of looking at the world. One is that God doesn't exist. Therefore, do whatever you want because nothing matters or God does exist. Therefore, you can't do any, anything you want because anything and everything you do matters. You know, this is, this is the, the radical crux of Christianity. I mean, think about the culture in which Christianity arose, not the Jewish culture, but the culture around it, the Ro Greco-Roman culture. Now, in the Greco-Roman culture, you had, you had pantheon of gods, right? You had all these gods. But if you've ever read anything about um, those Greco-Roman gods or if you've ever read Percy Jackson series, you would know that... The gods might be powerful. The gods might be immortal. The gods might be beautiful at times. The gods might have a lot of um, intelligence, but the gods are not good. The gods aren't just. The gods don't actually even know who you are and they don't care who you are. They definitely don't love you. In fact, it seems like the only reasons why you'd actually pray to any of these Greco-Roman gods was because one of two reasons, either you were so desperate to get what you needed you're so desperate for the rain to fall, you're so desperate for a child, so desperate for something that you were willing to risk being cursed by the God in order to get the God's attention. Or you just wanted to preempt the God's curse by offering a sacrifice, hoping that they would leave you alone. And I hear that and I think, that's how a lot of people, that's how a lot of Catholics live. That we stay away from God until we really, really need something. And then I'll show up and I'll pray and not just pray, I'm gonna pray on my knees. God hears from that position better. Maybe even fold my hands. Like, and I'll speak with like old English. Oh, thou. That's all I know. Um, or we go to church on Sunday to say, okay, God, you get this hour. The rest of the week is mine. If I give you this time, you can just stay out of the rest of my life. You know, there were actually gods of war in the, in the Middle East that if you were going into battle, what you would do is you go into the, the temple of this God. You'd offer a sacrifice. But if you really wanted victory, you would not only offer a sacrifice of something other than yourself, you'd actually take your, your sword or your spear and you'd actually cut yourself. And you would show that you're willing to bleed for this God so this God would give you victory. But you never knew if the God was going to bless you or if the God was going to blast you. And then along comes this message. Along comes this person, Jesus Christ. And what he reveals about God is not only, not only is God one, but he's actually good. And not only is he just, but he actually knows your name. Not only does he care about you, but he has counted every single hair on your head, every breath, you've, every heartbeat you've experienced. Not only does this God love you, but he's not waiting for you to shed your blood for him. He actually came to this earth. And what did he do? He took on a body so he could shed his blood for you. You don't have to cut yourself to get his attention. He has allowed himself to be beaten and broken just to get your attention. And to realize that this God, not only that, he let death overwhelm him. He conquered death so that you also, when death overwhelms you, when grief overwhelms you, that you're not forgotten. Even then, even when you're in the pit, that you realize, I'm not forgotten. That even the worst moment, the worst season in your life, you realize, I am not forgotten. Chesterton said, joy is that gigantic secret of the Christian. Why? Because you went from a world where, who knows, to a world where he knows and he cares. A world where I don't matter to a truth that says you actually matter to the most important being in the universe. How could that not give joy? Now, again, not, not a feeling of euphoria. What joy is, joy, I, would, I heard this definition, I loved it. Joy is the abiding and pervasive sense of well-being. Joy is the abiding and pervasive sense of well-being. Because I know that even on the worst day, even in the worst season, even on my last day, my last breath, in that moment, 
I'm not forgotten. On your worst day, in your worst moment, with your last breath, you are not forgotten. I mean, joy, the abiding and pervasive sense of well-being, the gigantic secret of the Christian. Of these things, we are witnesses. And yet we have to ask the question, well, why don't I have that? (laughs) Because I believe, why don't I have that? And I wonder, there's probably a lot of reasons. I think one reason is because of the thing, Pope John John Paul II, he, he, he named this thing we have in our, in a lot of people who believe, he called it practical atheism, where we'd say like, no, I, I actually believe that God exists, but I don't live like I believe that God exists. I believe that I matter to the Lord, but I actually don't live like I matter to the Lord. I believe that God has a plan for my life and that he already loves me. I don't have to earn his love, but I don't actually live like he already loves you. Like I don't have to earn his love. This practical atheism means that, yeah, I, I might believe God exists, but for all intents and purposes, it hasn't changed the way that I live. And I'm not just talking about avoiding sin. What I'm talking about is when you look in the mirror or your self-talk, how do you talk to yourself? Do you talk to, like, do you talk to yourself like someone who God said you're worth dying for? Do you talk to yourself like someone that God said, you don't have to be better first for me to love you? Do you talk to yourself like someone who's been the recipient of infinite grace and patience? Do you talk to yourself like someone who the father looks at and says, you're my son. You are my daughter. I will never forget you. I will never forsake you. See, I think this practical atheism goes so much deeper in our lives than just simply, well, I avoid sin. I try to do good. It goes down to the heart of who has your heart. When it comes to who you are, who do you believe? This world that doesn't care about you? Or this God who has said, you're worth everything to me. I think that's one of the problems. So one of the reasons we don't have joy is because of this practical atheism. And I think another reason is because a lot of us, uh, we, we don't even want to, but I think a lot of us have this thing that we might call conditional Catholicism. I think what conditional Catholicism could be is, is so it's, it's November, which means happy Christmas season, everyone. Um, so right now, up in Duluth, they have this place called Bentleyville. You probably heard it, heard about it. It's famous worldwide, or at least in northern Minnesota. Um, and it is a, uh, it's it's basically a light show that of Christmas lights, and it's huge. And there are cars that are backed up on the interstate, people trying to get off the road to walk to walk through in 20 below weather um, Christmas lights. It's really smart. Um, at the end of Bentleyville is a certain gentleman, a jolly old chap, um, by the name of Santa Claus, and you may have heard of him. I know him. Uh, but, uh, but how many times do you bring your kids to see Santa, and, or maybe even yourself when you're growing up, and you like, had to see Santa, or your kids had to see Santa? This was not an option. This like, mom, we have to go. We, Santa's only there from two o'clock to three o'clock. We have to be there. And they're in line. They're waiting to see Santa. They can't wait to see Santa unless they're really little, in which case you have those fun pictures of them just breaking down, melting down in front of Santa. Santa. Um, but there's this sense. I mean, there was, a, there was a teacher at our school at the University of Minnesota Duluth whose daughter, one of her daughters, saw Santa six times one Christmas season, essentially leading up to Christmas because she wanted to make sure that Santa heard the list and like understood, this is what I want. I don't mean this version of it. I want this version of it. She needed to see Santa. Here's the interesting thing. She needed to see Santa, not because she loved Santa, but because she wanted what Santa would bring her. A lot of us pray, not because we want him, but because we want what we think he will bring us. And that's what you might call like a conditional Catholicism. Because, you know, it's, it's interesting. Jesus is not a means and joy is not the goal. Joy is a bri- byproduct. It's a fruit. But he's the goal. He's the end. 
He's everything. And you think about, why would we not love this God who's revealed himself to us? Why would we not have joy every single day? I think one of the reasons is because our conditions are such that we, when we come to the Lord, it's not like, I, I think it's not like we're incredibly ungrateful. Like, God, you've never done anything for me. I think we just, I think that we just maybe have short memories. And so we don't say, God, you've never done anything for me, or what have you ever done for me, God? We just say, God, what have you done for me lately? There was a, a, a letter I got years, a couple years ago from a woman who was very distraught because her best friend had died. And of course, death is always, always a, a place of just sensitivity. But her best friend had died, and she said, this woman was so good. And she loved so well. She had a son with her husband, and the son with special needs, um, but, but she just gave, he poured her heart out for this son who grew up to be a young man who's able to like function in the world a bit better because of her love, because of her care and attentiveness. But her husband, at one point, decided he'd rather be single, and so he left her and he left their son. And she got sick, and she said, for a year, she was in and out of the hospital. And then on her last day, we were all there. All of her friends, all these people who loved her were all there. The priest had come to be with her and we're all there. But her, her son, on the day she died, her son didn't make it into the room in time. He didn't make it into the room until, her, until, until his mom had died. And she was so distraught over this, like how the injustice of this, ha having a child with special needs, having a husband who abandoned her, getting, this, getting sick and dying with her, without her son being able to say goodbye one last time. And in my response to her, I just, I wanted to acknowledge that is all real. Those are all things that could break any human being's heart. But I also needed to point out another piece of something that was true. Because in her email, she indicated that this husband who had left was now taking care of their adult son. That he had stepped up and the son was now living with his father. And his father was loving her, his son very well. Now for that last year, she had time to prepare. She had time to actually get ready, to get her heart ready for death. That she died, but she died surrounded by her friends. She died with a priest. She died with the last sacraments. But sometimes we say, but I didn't get what I wanted. So I'm going to take my heart back. And yet, even in the mo incredible moments of grief, we can still choose joy. Because in every moment, even in moments of grief, there are reasons for joy. We just have to let go of our conditions. I'm going to say that again. Even in our most incredible moments of grief, we can still choose joy, but we have to first let go of our conditions. I'll only be happy if. I'll only be faithful if. I'll only let you love me if. I will only have joy if. We can choose joy in every situation. In fact, we can, in every situation, we can just simply, simply say, Lord, thy will be done. And to allow the joy to grow. Like even in the midst of pain and sorrow and uncertainty, we can still choose joy. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. We have a whole set of the mysteries called the joyful mysteries. But have you ever stopped to like take a look at the joyful mysteries? They're not the most joyful of all mysteries in the world. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's, let's go through them a little bit here. We have the mystery of the, the Annunciation, first joyful mystery, where the archangel Gabriel appears to Mary. And says, you'll be the mother of the Messiah. She has her clarifying question. How can this be? Because I have no relationship with the man. He answers her question. She says, thy will be done. The very next line in the gospel says, then the angel departed from her. <laughs> You're 15. You'd be pregnant. Really? Yes. Okay. Poof. He's gone. <laughs> Talk about uncertainty. Talk about a moment of crisis. Talk about, a, I cannot be joyful in this moment. And here's what I would want. If I was in that scene, I would say, okay, listen. Here's what Gabriel needs to do. Gabriel needs to say, okay, here's what's going to happen. You said yes. Joseph's not going to believe you, but don't worry about it. I'll appear to him in a dream. It'll be fine. Then, <laughs> then there's going to be this census. You have to go to Bethlehem. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. You're not going to find a place to live, but don't worry about it. It'll be a really sweet story. Don't worry about it. A place to give birth, but it's going to be a stable. Everyone's going to sing songs. It'll be fine. Um, and then Herod's going to try to kill the child. You're going to go to Egypt. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. After a while, you come back from Egypt and you would grow. And then Jesus is actually going to become a, a pro preacher, prophet, savior of the world. And, and people aren't going to believe him. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. And then actually he's going to go to Jerusalem, suffer, die. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Like, that's what I would like. Give me the story. Tell me, roll it out for me. 
Mary, Mother Messiah. Really? Yes. Okay. Poof. <laughs> Sorrow, grief, uncertainty. Don't get me started. The visitation. Okay, now you're, you're pregnant. Let's go on a long walk. <laughs> Let's visit your cousin you haven't seen in a thousand years. Hope she believes you. The nativity. Now, let's go through them a little quicker now. The nativity. Yes, we have these songs. All is calm, all is bright, silent night. Those are not the right order, but yeah, you get it. I don't think that it was a very quiet night, except for that drummer boy who was playing the drums to wake up the baby from crying out loud. Who does that? But here they are, impoverished, unable to find a place to stay, no doula anywhere, and they just... Here's Joseph trying to figure this story out. Lay him in a manger. Oh, it's so sweet, in a manger. Oh, was that like Hebrew for cradle? Nope. It's, imagine how it was covered in like saliva and like muck out of the cow's mouths and stuff. And you're like, Joseph, you are not father of the year. This is not where you, this is not where you put a baby. What just, it's my firstborn. I don't know what else to do. You're like, <laughs> the fourth joyful mystery, the presentation where you hear Jesus bring, goes, into the goes into the temple. And Simeon says, wow, this child is destined for the fall and the rise of many in Israel. Also, Mary, your soul will be pierced. <laughs> and then finally, you have the finding of Jesus in the temple, which is great, ends, ends on a high note. <laughs> Can you imagine? God says, okay, I, the most precious gift I have, my son, I'm entrusting him to you, and you lose him. My parents left me at, well, my, my parents' friends left me at Chuck E. Cheese for like half an hour. They lost him for three days. It wasn't just an overnight quick thing. It was like three days, really. I don't understand. But here's the thing, is in every situation, we can choose joy. In every situation, we can say, but I know, I know God, I, God, I know you're here. Joy is the abiding and pervasive sense of well-being. It, it's a choice. It's like love. And like love, we can either chase the feeling or we can choose the reality. I want to say that again because it's a really cool line. <laughs> Joy is a choice, just like love. And just like love, we can either chase the feeling or we can choose the reality. And joy comes from faith. Joy comes from the fact that you know there is a God who already loves you. Joy comes from the fact that you know there is a God who has already accepted you. you, you joy comes from the fact that you know that God's here. And yes, um, this life has so much real pain and so much real sorrow and so much real grief, so much uncertainty. But this world actually does not have permission to take away your joy. Your sorrows and your uncertainties do not have permission to take away your joy. Years ago, there was a man named Nassim Taleb who wrote this, one of my favorite books of the last decade, um, called Anti-Fragile. Nassim Taleb is an economist and a thinker. He's actually a Middle Eastern Christian. And he noticed this thing in nature. He said, there are some things in nature that are fragile, and when they come up against an obstacle, they break. That's just to define fragile for you all. <laughs> There's some things in nature that are resilient. And there's a big movement right now for like, make your, help your kids become resilient. This is great, it's awesome. But you need to become resilient because if you're resilient, you can come up, come up against an obstacle and you hit it and you're able to make it through. But Nassim Tlaib pointed out something else that exists in nature. Something more that exists in nature because not something fragile comes up, not, comes up against an obstacle and breaks and not even something resilient that comes up against an obstacle and is unbroken but what he defined as anti-fragile. And something that's anti-fragile is when it encounters an obstacle, it doesn't get broken, it doesn't merely become resilient, it actually gets stronger. You are like that. You are, you are an anti-fragile organism. That you encounter, I don't know, a virus. <laughs> and if you survive it, you become stronger. When you're learning something, you're stretching your brain. And if you survive it, you become stronger. Your brain becomes smarter. Your muscles, test them out. 
and they become stronger. Like what you're made to be is, is an anti-fragile being. And I got to tell you, Christ, Christianity, if anything, Christianity is the most anti-fragile faith that has ever been dreamt of under the sun. The church, in fact, is the most anti-fragile organization that I've ever, ever read about, ever heard about, ever even, again, dreamed about. How many times has the church looked like it's been beaten and it comes back stronger? How many times has the church looked like, no, Christianity is done for, it is over with, there's no hope, there's no coming back from this kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, the church, God raises up saints in the church in the worst times and bring about an incredible revival that no one could have ever possibly imagined. And your faith and my faith, your joy and my joy is actually meant to be anti-fragile faith and anti-fragile joy. The kind that actually grows when it's been punched. The kind that actually is worth bearing witness to. The kind that even in our darkest day, it's not an argument that points to God, but it's proof of what God has done. And this can be part of your life and my life, uh, no matter how old or how young you are. Back in um, 2016, there's this girl in our diocese, her name is Mallory. And Mallory, in 2016, she was 15 years old. And uh, Mallory had, had come to a bunch of our, our camps that we put on for junior high students. And one of the things that, that, uh, that she got from that camp was she had got a devotion for the Chapel of Divine Mercy, loved praying with her sister, loved praying the rosary with her sister, loved going into adoration. But on December, December 21st, 2016, Mel went to the hospital for some checkups and they found that she had cancer. It's really remarkable. Because from that day, Mel said two things. She said, either I'm praying, I'm praying that God either heals me and that in healing me, he's glorified. And people like come to know who he is and believe in him because of what he's, how he healed me. Then she said, my other prayer is if he doesn't heal me, that my death glorifies him too. A 15 year old kid. That if he heals me, it glorifies him. And if he doesn't heal me, that people fall in love with him. Mel would do this thing we, we taught, him, taught her and her sister and other, other, other campers how to do. Um, basically, at the end of the day, we'd have them write down a rose and a thorn. Have you ever heard this practice? So at the end of the day, um, you write down one thing that was good, that was your rose. Then you write down one thing that was, that was tough, it was a struggle. That was your thorn. And, and Mal, she... Uh, she loved the, the UMD, Minnesota Duluth. She loved the Bulldogs. It's the Division I hockey team. Um, and at one point, she's in the hospital, and uh, Bishop Serba, our bishop, came and visited her. And so she wrote in, in her, uh, so did the Bulldogs, the hockey team, visited her in the hospital. And she wrote down her rose, uh, the UMD Bulldogs, the hockey team, visited me in my hospital room. And then a little further down, it says, Bishop Serba also showed up. <laughs> <laughs> but at one point, it was, it was August 26th, uh, 2016, in her journal. And you're like, how did you? Get a hold of her journal? <laughs> like, what's the priest going through a 15-year-old girl's journal? <laughs> her parents shared it with us. Uh, on August 26, 2016, she, she read uh, Matthew 25, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. And she wrote down this. She said, well, nothing really, this is her words. She said, nothing really stuck out. So I picked this, this word, and then the door was locked. I picked this because it's kind of like, you know, you only have one chance to make your life worthy of going to heaven. After you die, the doors to heaven will either be open to you or locked. So make your life worthy of going. So make your life worthy of going to heaven. Smiley face. 
earlier on, on December 21st, 2015, 2016. She wrote down a rose in her thorns. She said, Rose, going to adoration tonight and being able to hand my load to God. Thorn. Spending all afternoon, evening in the ER and then finding the tumor. Then in parentheses she put, but that's also kind of my rose. Smiley face. Almost one year, 11 months from her diagnosis on December 21st. It was the first Tuesday in November, two days from now. We had a youth minister meeting and before the meeting started, someone in knew her well said, hey, Father Mike, Mal is, um, she's getting confirmed today. Bishop's actually in her hospital room right now, giving her the sacrament of confirmation. So can we pray for her before, before the meeting starts? I'm like, oh my gosh, absolutely. So like we all stood up like in, in, the, in, our, in our meeting room and like faced the hospital direction and just like extended our hands, just asked the Holy Spirit of a power, the Holy Spirit of love and self-control, the Holy Spirit of just God's Holy Spirit, including the Holy Spirit of healing to come upon Mal and her hospital room and bishops confirming her. Two hours later, we had mass together and we said, okay, this is it. This is the mass that we're celebrating on behalf of Mal. Because she had one prayer. That prayer was that God either heal her and be glorified or that he doesn't heal her and God still be glorified. And while we were celebrating that mass on November 7th, in the middle of the mass, we were celebrating an offering for her Mal stepped from this world and entered God's presence. This is a girl who was only 15 years old, but knew that it was possible to choose joy no matter what the circumstances were. That she wasn't expecting any kind of condition. She wasn't placing any condition on her faith. She wasn't placing any condition on her joy. She was simply saying, God, whatever happens, I just want people to know who you are. God, whatever happens, I just want people to glorify you. God, whatever happens, I just want people to know that you love them. We are witnesses of these things. And joy is not an argument, but joy is proof. And the reality is, this night, in every moment of your life, in every moment of my life, we have the opportunity to do that. We have the opportunity to choose joy. We have the opportunity to bear witness to joy. And this is what we witness. That there is a God who already knows you. That has loved you to death. That your life has meaning. And everything you do matters. That you matter to the God of the universe. If that isn't a reason for joy, I don't know what is. And that's what we give witness to. Joy is not an argument, but joy is proof. All glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you.